kind of time constraint, just feel free at Ride Home to preach and just preach from your heart and tell us what we need to hear from God's Word. So, Dr. Getch, we love you. We look forward to hearing the Word of God preached this evening. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor, and thank you for joining us tonight. What a privilege to be around God's Word, and uh, we don't want to ever take that for granted. And I think if anything we've learned over these past eight or nine months now is that we dare not take things for granted. And uh, we have these privileges of having the Word of God and uh, being able to hear the Word of God preached or sung. What a joy that is to our hearts and lives. And so thank you for being faithful. Uh, It's a blessing to see churches really all over the country just trying to do what's right and uh, take care of people's health and keep everybody well, but at the same time not sacrificing our privilege to serve the Lord and to worship the Lord as we know we ought. And so thank you for your faithfulness. And uh, we're certainly praying down there in Southern California for you here in the Bay Area that God will continue to use Heritage Baptist Church in a marvelous way. And we're so thankful for the friendship and partnership that we feel with your church I tell folks, when you're in the Bay Area, go visit Heritage Baptist Church. You'll find it just like Lancaster Baptist Church in so many different ways. And we appreciate that and love that about our ministries and the opportunity we have to serve the Lord together in these, in these interesting days. And uh, I, I've been telling folks, these could be the most exciting days since the book of Acts. And it's just a wonderful time to know the Lord and to serve Him and uh, see what God is going to do in the midst of sometimes uh, uh, things that we look at as negative, uh, that's when God sometimes steps in and does something very positive. And if you study revivals down through the centuries, God always picks those moments when we're at the lowest tide, and then God works. And so be faithful and be a part of what God's going to do in the days to come. Well, take your Bible and turn to Jeremiah chapter 20. And uh, if you're watching at home, I hope that you'll uh, uh, take your your Bible or device and go to Jeremiah chapter 20. And uh, we're going to stand out of respect for God's word uh, tonight. I'm just going to look at one verse as our text, but we will come back uh, to this chapter and some other verses around it in just a moment. But Jeremiah chapter 20, and let me call your attention to verse number 9. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. You may be seated. No matter how hard man works at it, this world is never going to be a perfect place. Now, man tries hard. Man, through different avenues, tries to make this a utopia in which we can live and enjoy life. Our medical teams and and, uh, people who think about the environment and people who think about sociology, people work hard at trying to make this planet a wonderful place in which to live. But it's never going to be a perfect place. Now, it once was. When God created the heavens and the earth, he created them perfectly. In fact, God stepped back on that last day of creation, and the Bible says that God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. God created a perfect place. But we read a little further in the scriptures, and we come to Genesis chapter 3. The Bible says that the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And the serpent said unto the woman, Hath God said ye shall not eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden? And the woman said, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shalt thou touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said, you shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, and your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. The eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Adam and Eve sinned. They disobeyed God's command. In chapter 2 of Genesis, shortly after creating them, he said, Of all the trees in the garden, thou mayest freely eat. But of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So Adam and Eve disobeyed the command of God. 
In chapter 3 of Genesis, God tells them now in verse 17, Because thou hast eaten of the fruit of the tree, where have I commanded thee, saying, Thou shouldest not eat? Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. And you and I that know the Bible and know what God is saying here, we understand that all of the device, all of the division, all of the the destruction, all of the devastation, all of the disease, all of the death that we look at today in this world is a result of sin. It's a result of that curse upon the earth because of sin. Why? Because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. So when man sinned, this earth became an imperfect place. When we look around today, we see the effects of now hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of sin. We see the results of man's sin. We look around at the chaos and the confusion and the, and, and the, the, the complexities of life today. We realize this is all a result of sin. And I don't know about you, but it's kind of discouraging. You watch the news, you try to interact with people in this world today, and it just seems like it's discouraging. It reminds me back when I was in college. When I was in college back in the early 1970s, there was hardly a chapel speaker that would ever come to chapel on a daily basis and not talk about how the United States of America would never see its 200th birthday. I mean, preachers would tell us we have messed up, we have blown it, we, have, we are on a course of destruction, and we are not going to make it to July 4th, 1976. And you know, it seemed like at that particular point in history that the United States of America was in trouble. I mean, the 60s had ushered in a time of great rebellion. Uh, there were riots in the streets down in Watts, Los Angeles, and on the university campuses like Kent State University. Uh, the rock music culture had come into our, our uh, United States and the free sex movement and, and things were just coming off the wheels, as we say. The, the, the wheels were coming off of our morality and our ethics and our religious practices. Prayer in public, public schools was no longer allowed. Bible reading. I went to public school. I did not go to kindergarten. I grew up in Watertown, Wisconsin, and Watertown, Wisconsin is the home of the nation's first kindergarten, 1848. You can still go to the uh, building that they used. It's a historical monument there in Watertown. You can visit the first building that was ever uh, used to teach kindergarten, Watertown, Wisconsin, 1848. But when I went to school, they didn't have kindergarten. I'm older than you think. And so I went to first grade and second grade, third grade, fourth grade in the public school. And every morning when I would go into that classroom, there was a speaker up in the very far corner of that classroom. And uh, the principal of our school, he'd come on that speaker. His voice would come on and he'd say, good morning, boys and girls. I hope you're all at your desks. I hope you're all seated because I want to read a verse out of the Bible to you that will help us today. He would read a verse, and then he'd say, now fold your hands and bow your heads and close your eyes, and I'm going to pray that God will give us a great day. And he would pray. You know, I went to fifth grade, same school. Speaker was still up in the corner of the classroom, but it was only used for announcements because prayer and Bible reading had been taken out of the public school. Many people saw that as a signal toward destruction. Many people thought, we're we're not going to make it. Uh, We've we've forgotten God. We're turning our back on God. We're we're rejecting God in this country, and and, and, and we're not going to live. We're not going to make it. We're going to destroy ourselves by July 4th, 1976. And you know what? I drank the Kool-Aid. I mean, I believed it. I thought, there's no way. I mean, God is angry with us. God is upset with us. And I really believed when I was in college that we would never make it July 4th, 1976. You know, today we look around and we wonder, is God upset with our country? Is God upset with the way that we're going? 
Is God bringing some of this or allowing some of this trial and difficulty in our life because of the direction that we are headed as a nation? May I encourage you tonight to lift your eyes above the chaos, above the confusion, above the conditions of the culture. And could I encourage you tonight to look above it all to the Lord Jesus Christ? I want to look at the life of Jeremiah tonight in and around this passage of Scripture we've read because I believe that there are three observations that we can make from a very difficult and devastating time in the life of this prophet Jeremiah that are very relevant to us today. You know, the more I read the Bible, I'm more and more amazed at how relevant God's Word is to today. When I read the life of Jeremiah... I find him in a predicament. I find him in a situation, a circumstance that is much like ours today. So let's make some observations from Jeremiah's life. First of all, we see a universal collapse. Now, by the time we get to Jeremiah chapter 20, Jeremiah is not a young man anymore. Jeremiah has been around the block a few times, as we would say. This is not his first rodeo. In fact, Jeremiah was alive during the time of Josiah's reign as king. Do you remember Josiah? He was the boy king. He came to the throne at the age of eight. And he followed his father and his grandfather, who had led the nation of Israel into all kinds of idolatry. His father Amnon and and his, his grandfather Manasseh, they had led the nation into idolatrous worship for 57 years prior to Josiah's reign. And all over the countryside, there were molten images and carved works and groves that had been built to all these false gods. But Josiah comes to the throne as a little boy, just eight years old. And the Bible says in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, as a teenager, a 16-year-old, he begins to turn his face toward the God of David, his father. You see, he turns away from his, his physical heritage of Ammon and Manasseh, and he begins to look to his spiritual heritage of David. And he begins to turn the nation, in his mind, back toward God. And in, the, in, in his 20th year, the Bible says that Josiah decides we've got to worship God. We've got to come back to God's house. We, 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 we've got to assemble together. And so Josiah, he gets some money from the government funds and he gives it to the workmen and the workmen begin to repair and amend the house of the Lord. You see, the house of God was there, but it hadn't been used for 57 plus years. So they were, they were repairing the house of God, and as they did, they found a book. And they weren't sure what it was. And so they took the book to Shaphan the scribe. And when Shaphan read that book, he realized it was the very law of God. It was the word of God. It was the, the, the Torah, as they would have called it. And so they took it to the king, and and Josiah hears the word of God read. And as Josiah hears that word read, the Bible says he rent his clothes, which was symbolic of his humility before God. And Josiah says, this is why we're in trouble. This is why our nation is in collapse. We've rejected God. We've rejected his word. And so he calls the people together, all of them, the old, the young, the male, the female, the children, the parents. He brings them all together, and they read the Word of God. And upon its completion, Josiah stands and he says, now what you just heard is what I'm going to live, and I'm going to lead this nation according to this book. And Josiah leads the people to stand to it. And when they stood to the word of God, the Bible says that God sent revival. For 31 years, they experienced an amazing revival in the land of Israel. Jeremiah lived through all of that. But Jeremiah also lived to the time when Josiah left the throne. And the next three kings that came, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, And Zedekiah, those next three kings, they took the nation of Israel right back into idolatry. 
And the whole time, Jeremiah is crying out. He said, look, folks, we got to stop. We've been down this road before. We know what's going to happen if we go this direction. And he's trying to call the people back to God. And all through the book of Jeremiah, he is crying out, saying, don't go this way. You've got to repent. You've got to turn back to God. In chapter 2 and verse 19, he says, Thy own wickedness and thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Thy own backsliding shall correct thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God. In chapter 4 and verse 3, he tells the people to break up their fallow ground, to take away the foreskins off of their hearts. He says, you've become desensitized to God. You've become insensitive to his word. You have calluses on your heart and your mind. You've got to get tender again to the things of God. In chapter 4 and verse 22, he says, my people are foolish. They have not known me. They are sottish children. They are wise to do evil. But to do good, they have no knowledge. What does that kind of sound like today? They're wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge. We've gotten really good in America at corruption. And we've gotten even better at covering it up. We are wise to do evil, but to do good, we have no knowledge. So Jeremiah cries in chapter 7 and verse 3, amend your ways and your doings. In chapter 8, he tells them the wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Lo, they've rejected the word of the Lord and what wisdom is in them. He's crying out to the leadership, the spiritual leaders, the political leaders, and he's saying, you're not wise. You've become foolish. Why? Because you've rejected God's word. And by the time they get to chapter 9, Jeremiah says, oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. And now as he comes to chapter 13 of this book, he prophesies of the coming Babylonian captivity. He says, we've pushed the envelope too far, folks. God is angry. We're going into captivity. We're going to be taken away. In chapter 13 and verse 19, he says, the cities of the south shall be shut up and none shall open them. Judah shall be carried away. They shall be holy taken away. If you look up at verse 15 of chapter 19, he says, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I'll bring upon this city and upon all her towns all the evil that I have pronounced against it because they have hardened their necks that they might not hear my words. God is about to cause a universal collapse. And Jeremiah gets very specific in verse four of chapter 20. Thus saith the Lord, behold, I'll make thee a terror to thyself and to all thy friends, and they shall fall by the sword of their enemies, and thine eyes shall behold it, and I'll give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive into Babylon, and shall slay them with the sword. He's saying, we're going down. We're collapsing. We're being taken away. And he gets very specific in verse 5. He says, moreover, I will deliver all the strength of this city. All of your military defense systems, they're gone. They don't exist. You have no defense against this. In verse 5, he goes on, all the labors thereof, your job, your employment, it's gone. He says, and all the precious things thereof, your culture, your entertainment, your sporting events, your theater, it's gone. And all the treasures of the kings of Judah. Your your retirement plan, your financial hope in the bank, it's gone. Wholly carried away. A universal collapse. Now, none of this surprises Jeremiah. He's seen it coming. He has warned He has tried to preach. He has said time and time again, thus saith the Lord, and the people have given a deaf ear to the message. So Jeremiah is not surprised 
at this universal collapse. But notice, secondly, he is surprised at an unrelenting criticism. Jeremiah is not surprised that the nation is about to be carried into captivity. He is surprised that he's about to get blamed for it. If you look at chapter 20 and verse number 1, the Bible says, Now Pashur, the son of Emer the priest, who was also chief governor in the house of the Lord, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. Then Pashur smote Jeremiah the prophet and put him in stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. Now Pashur, in verse 1, is identified as a priest. We know that Jeremiah is a prophet. Now, as you study the Old Testament, you realize that these were two different offices. God used priests, he used prophets. In a sense, if you were to put them on a flow chart, though, the priest and the prophet were somewhat equal. For instance, when God gave his word to his people prior to this book we call the Bible, God spoke his word to people through priests and prophets. He would deliver his word through these men that held these offices. So in a sense, the priest and the prophet were somewhat equal. Now, there were false prophets in the days of Jeremiah. There were those that would go out and they would give a message that was not true. It was not a message from the Lord. And when that happened, when someone suspected that someone was preaching something that was not of the Lord, they would take that to the high priest. The high priest would convene all of the priests They would listen to the message, they would hear the complaint, and they would determine if this person was truthful or dishonest. But none of that's being done here. Pashur is taking things as a priest into his own hands. You see, Jeremiah the prophet has come into his territory and he starts preaching this doom and gloom message. And Pashur doesn't like it. And so the Bible says in verse 2, he smote Jeremiah. The the Hebrew word there for smote, it means to strike with the hand or to strike with an object. So here is this physical punishment for this message that Jeremiah is preaching. Then it says in verse 2, he put his feet in stocks by the high gate of Benjamin. The high gate of Benjamin was the place where people went in and out of the city. So here's now the prophet Jeremiah. He's been beaten physically. His feet are placed in stocks, and he's put at the entry point of the city where everybody can go by and laugh at him, deride him, defrock him of his position as a prophet. And by the way, none of this is legal. None of this is according to the law. None of this is according to God's commands concerning these types of things. But you see, all that's thrown out the window here. Pasher decides that individually he's going to take things into his own hand and put Jeremiah in his place. You know, the devil thinks that if he can silence the voices of God, he wins. The devil thinks if he can bring a little persecution, a little pressure on the people of God, he wins. He thinks if he can silence those that are preaching, thus saith the Lord, if he can silence God's people, then the message will be stopped. And the devil loves it when churches close. The devil loves it when the seats in a church are empty. The devil loves it when the parking lot is gated shut at the church. The devil loves it when the message is silenced. Oh, the devil, he was laughing that day when they sealed that stone upon the tomb just outside of Jerusalem. He kicked up his heels in glee and thought, now we've got him. The Roman centurion had the guard set. There was no way he could escape. The devil had silenced the message of Jesus Christ, but the devil forgot that behind that stone was the very one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. You see, the devil has a really bad memory. The devil thinks, I can stop the message by stopping the people of God. 
One day the devil laughed as they drugged the apostle Paul outside the city and left him for dead. Now we'll hear this babbler no more. But all of a sudden that body began to move. Paul stood to his feet and shook the dust off his feet and said, uh, though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, but woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, Peter and John were told, you will never speak in the name of Jesus Christ again. Peter said, how can we but not speak the things that we've both seen and heard? You see, the lion hath roared, who can but fear? The Lord has spoken, who can but prophesy? The devil thinks that if he can bring a little problem, a little persecution, a little pressure, that he can stop the work of God. Jeremiah, he's discouraged. He's thinking, Lord, I didn't sign up for this. I mean, I, I just tried to obey you. I, I just tried to do what you told me to do. In fact, look at verse 7. He says, O oh Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I'm in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. For since I speak, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil, because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me, and a derision daily. Jeremiah says, God, I, you lied to me. I mean, you called me to preach the message, and I have faithfully preached it. I have done everything you've told me to do according to your word. I have simply been the delivery boy. I have simply been faithful preaching the message. God, you lied to me. You never told me that I'd get blamed for this. You never told me that I was the one that was going to be persecuted. I was the one that was going to suffer loss. Jeremiah has decided, I'm out. This wasn't in my contract. This wasn't in my job description. And in verse 9, Jeremiah says, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. Jeremiah said, I knew this was coming. This collapse was, was, was not a surprise to me. But Jeremiah is very surprised that he's the one getting blamed for it. An unrelenting criticism. But I want you to notice something. You see... Jeremiah didn't have the privilege of having the New Testament. Jeremiah couldn't go ahead in the book and read, yea, in all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Jeremiah didn't have the privilege of reading Peter's words where he said, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that shall try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Jeremiah is discouraged. Jeremiah is ready to quit. Jeremiah doesn't want to go forward. I want you to see not only a universal collapse, not only an unrelenting criticism, but I want you to see finally tonight an underlying condition. Look at verse 9 very carefully. The Bible says, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. Period. Now, I don't know how much time elapses between that period and the next word. Maybe it was just a few seconds. Maybe it was a minute or two. I personally think Jeremiah put the pen down, pushed back from the table where he was writing, and walked out the door. He said, I'm done. Lord, I, I did what you told me to do. I was faithful. I was just obeying you. I was trusting you. And now, this is what I get. Th this is what happens. Jeremiah is saying, I'm sorry. I'm done. Period. And I don't know, I may be wrong, but I think some time went by. I think he walked away, just like some folks are tempted to do right now. Just kind of, you know what? I didn't bring this on. It's not my fault. 
I mean, I, I was just trying to be faithful to the Lord, trying to raise my family, trying to go to church and, 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 and follow the Bible. And, and now all this chaos and all this confusion and all of this stuff going on in our culture, I, I just don't understand. I mean, I thought God was a good God. I, I, I kept hearing that God would bless me if I did what was right. I, I just heard that, you know, if I would be faithful, then God would be faithful to me. And I'm just not seeing it right now. We're tempted to put the pen down, slide off the chair, walk out the door, say, I'm not going to speak in his name anymore. Thousands and thousands and thousands of Christian, Christians across this country are at this point tonight. Where they feel like it's just not worth it. I, I'm not going to press against the devil's attacks anymore. I just want to be comfortable. I, I, just, I just want to be left alone. I, I, I don't want to face this kind of pressure. I, I don't want to go through a time of persecution. I, I don't want to have to, you know, be persecuted for my faith or maybe die for my faith. I, I just, I don't, I'm not interested, period. I don't know how much time went by, but I'm thankful verse 9 doesn't end with that period. Somewhere along the line, maybe it was just a few seconds of thought. Maybe it was several moments. Maybe Jeremiah came back into the room, picked up the pen again, and noticed what he wrote in verse 9. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. I tried to walk away. I tried to get out. I tried to take an exit. But in those moments, in those days of trying to get out of God's plan for my life, I was weary and forbearing. I had to come back because inside of me there was a fire burning. And can I say to you tonight, dear child of God, if you are born again, there's a fire burning inside of you called the Holy Spirit of God. He lives inside of us. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own, for you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God with your body and your spirit, which are God's inside of every child of God, there is something that's greater than he that's outside this body. What you have inside of you is greater than anything you will face outside of you. Because inside of us is the very power of God that works in us. May tonight we determine that whatever the pressure, whatever the persecution that the devil thinks he can bring against the church, remember that God has already promised the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Remind ourselves tonight that one day Jesus Christ is going to win. He's going to be victorious. We are on the winning side. And we dare not forbear. We dare not get weary in well-doing. We must keep going for the cause of Christ. God is still on the throne. God is still at work. You heard this, this evening of precious souls being saved this week. God is not dead. God is not asleep. God's not in a coma. The devil may seem to be winning on the scoreboard right now, but it ain't over yet. The game hasn't ended. We know from reading the last words of this book that Jesus Christ wins. We need to pick up the pen. We need to sit back to the table. We need to continue our testimony, keep writing our story, keep writing the story of Heritage Baptist Church. There are still chapters to be written for the glory of God. I remember July 4th, 1976 very well. It was a Sunday. I started a revival that morning in El Paso, Texas. Sunday school was a good crowd. We had a good service. Enjoyed some good fellowship. Sunday morning service, the auditorium was pleasantly full. Again, a liberty to preach and a number of decisions at the altar. Sunday night, a good crowd back. Good fellowship. A good spirit in the church. I'm going to tell you something. My heart was heavy. Because I honestly believed in my heart that this was it. I thought this is the last day we have. 
We're not getting past midnight tonight. Our country has spiraled away from God. Our country deserves destruction. I didn't believe that we would live in this country past midnight. I mean, I was told that all the interstate highways that came into existence back in those 60s and early 70s were built for our military to be able to take over this country. That's why there were only exits so many miles so they could block those off and control this country. I mean, I believed it. I drank the Kool-Aid. I took on the conspiracy theories, and I thought that day, this is the last day I'll preach. And when folks drifted away from that that auditorium on Sunday night, I was staying in a little room on the campus of that church. and I put my Bible away and changed my clothes. I decided to go on a walk. And I began to walk the streets of El Paso that night. If you've ever been to El Paso, you know it's a very long city east to west. In fact, right now, if you try to drive across that city, even in good traffic, it'll take you well over an hour to go from east to west across that city. Very long east to west, not very wide north to south. It skirts along our border with Mexico, the great city of Juarez, just across the border. It wasn't nearly as large of a city in those days, but I began to walk those streets and pray. And I remember saying, God, we don't deserve to make it another day. You have every right to destroy our country. We have, we have blown it. You've given us your mercy. You've given us your grace. You began this nation on the foundation of God's word and we've turned our back on you. We deserve destruction. I remember saying, God, could you give us a little more time? I mean, I'm just getting started. I've only preached a couple of years of revivals. I'd sure like a chance at some more. Lord, I'm just newly married. I'd like to have some kids if you'd allow. See if I could maybe raise them up for you to serve the Lord. God, could you give us a little more time? Could you give us a chance? I just prayed, walked those streets. Kind of got lost in my thoughts and prayers. I looked at my watch. It was 12.05. And I said, hey, we're still here. It's five minutes past midnight. It's July 5th. We're still here. I think I'm still here. Yeah, hey, we made it. Then I thought, yeah, but, yeah, but I'm, on, I'm on central time. God might be on mountain time. I, I, I better keep praying. I kept walking. I kept praying. And pretty soon, 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock and 4 o'clock. And I remember as I came back to that church property, just as that sun was coming up over that eastern horizon on El Paso, I didn't hear an audible voice. But God said to me in my heart, he said, son, you just be faithful with every day I give you and let me worry about the calendar. Could I just leave you with that thought tonight? Tomorrow, be faithful. Let God worry about the calendar. He's got it all mapped out. He's got it all under control. God knows when that trumpet's going to sound. He knows when he's going to send his son to come and get us. And he knows about every soul that's going to be saved until that trumpet sounds. You and I have a responsibility, no matter what's happening around us, oh, we're going to see some collapsing. We're going to see some contention. But friend, we've got an underlying condition. We've got somebody living inside of us that's greater than anything we're going to face in the days, the months, the years that God gives us. And I pray for these boys and girls and these young people in this room that God will give us a whole bunch of more years. Not for my sake, but to give you a chance to win your family to Christ, to see your loved ones saved, to see revival in your community for the glory and honor of Jesus Christ. I believe God's pleased with those kinds of prayers. Maybe we need to walk some streets tonight. Not to protest, but to petition the God of heaven. To say, Lord, another space of grace. 
for your glory, we pray. Let's bow. Lord, thank you for including Jeremiah in the Bible. Here was a man that didn't see